Julia, the less favorite twin sister of the recently deceased Martha, based in World War II era Italy, narrates their story and the horrifying surreal trauma they went through in midst of war. The paranormal events Julia experiences makes her question her own sanity and her ability to differentiate between reality and fiction. Hi folks, I'm R, your narrator. This game was heavily suggested to me, so here we are. Keep in mind that this video will have spoilers ahead. With that said, let's begin. Julia Kay introduces herself in a narrative style in an undisclosed location, explaining her story from childhood starting from summer of 1929 when Julia was sent off to stay with her nanny. During that time, Julia only being with her nanny, with her sister Martha being with their mother, she asks her nanny for the story about the white lady who seemingly kills young ladies when it's foggy. So the nanny explains the white lady was a woman in love who was killed by the hands of the man she loved so much out of jealousy, with her body seemingly being thrown into the lake. The man as punishment gets a death sentence by the town folks, paying for what he had done. Despite the atrocity and crime committed against her, the spirit of the woman trapped in the depths of the lake she was thrown into, with the town people being unable to find her corpse, comes out when there's deep fog looking for the man she loved, with many fishermen claiming they have heard and even seen the white lady wailing in sadness. As a quick remedy and just for quick relief, the white lady often kills wandering young women, taking them to the depths of the lake. Julia then explains that their happiest time in life was when she was with her nanny, spending three years with her until she went back home to her mother, when she forgot how to be happy. She mysteriously suffers from memory loss, with her memories only coming back after 15 years in 1944. She could have sustained memory loss due to physical head trauma or maybe even as a coping mechanism due to mental trauma. In July 16th, 1944, being present in the wooded lake, Julia sets up a camera which takes photographs in intervals thanks to a device her father created, not remembering the events leading to then. While adjusting her camera for taking photos of whether animals or nature, she stumbles upon a body of a person floating on the surface of the lake. Julia explains that the lake was hers and she didn't want anything horrible as a death happen in it, as it was her place of immersing deep in thought and daydreaming, a place of solitude as if she had handcrafted it. The lake was my world, where I would spend entire days daydreaming. I would lose myself in my thoughts, but that was a rude awakening. So terrible. Julia frantically rushes to the lake, swimming towards the buddy, noticing the buddy wears her dress, with the corpse being no other than her twin sister, Martha. I instantly noticed that the person was wearing one of my dresses. I was scared. I dragged that lifeless body as best as I could to the shore trying not to drown myself. Only when I lifted her in my arms did I realize who she was. It was my sister, my twin, a part of me, dead. Impossible to comprehend. I was desperate. I didn't know what to do or to think. Unable to accept the death of her sister, she takes her duct tack styled medallion, indicating that they were both born in 26 of February 1923, who proceeds to put it around her own neck. Soon, her parents rush towards them, with her mother hugging her intently, showing compassion and love, something she hasn't felt from her, as she preferred Martha. As Julia doesn't want this moment to pass, she pretends to be Martha, living in a lie, believing that she has no other choice but to pretend to be Martha for the rest of her life. Next day, putting Martha's corpse in a coffin, seemingly preparing her for a funeral, Julia explores the room, uncovering more information about their lives. Erich, the father, is a German army general living in Italy in World War II, with Julia making a remark that her mother would be a more suitable candidate if she were a man, seemingly being someone who has the right attitude for this kind of job. 
Julia continues explaining that they are a wealthy family and that she and her sister were so identical that people could only tell them apart by wearing different clothes. Which brings the question to how Martha died in the lake and why she was wearing Julia's dress. Heeding to her mother's commands, Irene, to take the flowers out in order to have a perfect symmetrical decoration. The door to the hallway closes suddenly, with Irene talking to Eric about their recently deceased daughter, Martha, whom they think is Julia. The father, visibly saddened, is told off by Irene, who blatantly mentions that she didn't care about Julia and that Julia harmed Martha, her favorite daughter. I want to stay with my daughter. Your daughter? Your daughter? You have another daughter, you know. The one who's still alive. Remember? What are you talking about, Irena? Julia is dead. What kind of comment is that? How can you? You should be thinking about Martha. Julia harmed Martha. You know that, right? And as if that were not enough, she has now also abandoned her. It's the same old story. Everything is always Julia's fault, isn't it? Her fault for Marta being deaf and for you being infertile. As Irene leaves being clearly angry, Irene takes the time to weep for Julia and apologize to her for not being around as much, being occupied with war. All the time I didn't spend with you. But now I'm home. We can go fishing together, we can take pictures of butterflies, no, we can't do anything together anymore, can we? Nothing. I miss you, Julia. I miss you. As time passes on, with Julia still pretending to be Martha due to the love she received from her mother instead of abuse, she starts to feel guilty, not disclosing the fact that it is Martha who died. As a direct consequence, she starts having vivid nightmares. Some of the nightmares driven from her guilt-ridden conscience is gruesome imagery of cutting Martha's face out and wearing it herself, representing how she is possessing her identity, a foreshadowing to what is to come. Waking up in their large shared room, Julia gets ready by dressing up, intending to meet up with her partner Lapo when she decides to read her own diary. Dated July 16th, she reads a diary entry how it was her who asked Martha to accompany her to the lake taking photographs. Julia expresses in the diary how the lake felt odd that day, as if some sort of presence was nearby, thinking the legend of the white lady might have gotten into her mind. Going down to the hall, with her parents just leaving to prepare for the funeral, Julia picks up a newspaper, reading how the media is escalating Martha's death to advance their political propaganda. Julia Kay, a young woman from a respectable family, brutally murdered near her home. Carabinieri investigates. A possible political motive emerges. Martha was not killed by politics or war. She was killed by something much closer and much less clear. As time passes, Julia starts doubting herself if it was her who caused the death of Martha. The never-ending guilt makes her want to review the film role still left at the lake, giving her the perfect time as her parents are away, who became more paranoid after the death of Martha. Unsurprisingly, she notices the door being locked, preventing her from leaving. Julia, being determined to find the cause of Martha's death, manages to find a way to leave the house and head to the lake, with the sky being both dark and foggy. As she gets closer to the lake, negative thoughts overtake her, believing stronger that it must have been her who hurt Martha, who was envious of the love she was getting. Julia then encounters visions of the white lady, thinking it might be her fear playing with her mind as she tries to quickly collect all the three setup cameras in different spots of the lake area. Julia. Julia. <laughs> 
Managing to collect all three cameras, heading back, a monstrous entity dressed in white grabs her arm, whom she manages to evade, running through trenches which become deeper and deeper, leading to a door decorated with human skulls, as if representing the casualties of war. Entering the house in an alternate version of her own home, where she becomes hunted with unsettling visions, she suddenly wakes up on her bed, realizing it was nothing but a nightmare. Slowly getting up, Julia notices a pool of blood beneath her, which confuses her as it's not her time yet. On the nightstand, she finds the selfie photo she took of herself earlier, being in the picture frame Martha used to tell her to use, but with her picture being upside down. It's very rude, but I could pick up the phone and listen to their conversation. As the phone rings intended for Irene, her mother, she picks up the other phone in her room, listening in to her and their priest's conversation, who discuss the death of Martha, whom everyone thinks is Julia, with the mother suspecting Lapo, the boy dating Julia, which the mother didn't approve of, and the priest believing the nanny must have been involved as she used tarot cards, which the priest thinks is sacrilege. This depicts how each individual is biased according to their their own perspective and belief system, and how detrimentally judgmental they can get. A radio announcement then explains a new ordinance by the German government as the war is about to come to a bloody conclusion, for people to lock themselves in their houses and not even look outside of the windows, as the German troops have orders to shoot at anyone in the streets or looking out of windows, believing that they could be snipers. Upstairs, she finds a note written by Martha in informing their mother about Julia being pregnant and to observe her when she takes a bath in the lake to witness her tummy growing, which shocks Julia reading it, saying that she's not pregnant. It seems as if Julia is still suffering from memory loss, being in a haze, not fully remembering what happened at the lake and many other times. A letter by the nanny reveals that she's in the luxurious villa they used to live in, with them moving into a smaller, more covert house which the nanny lived in, in order to stay safe from enemy forces of allies. She also finds a bottle of pervitin lying around, which her mother takes too many of and too often, which makes Julia make a remark that Irene has become more agitated since taking them. Pervitin was a drug which in fact was an earlier version of crystal meth, which was widely used during World War II amongst German soldiers, which was said to be effective in increasing alertness and keeping the mood up, creating a sense of euphoria, allowing soldiers to perform even with little sleep. Therefore, pervitin despite being good for certain situation, caused long-term addiction and other problems. As she goes to the developing room and develops the photos from that day, she sees that she was carrying Martha's body to the shore, trying to save her, which makes her exhale in relief that the evidence matches her fuzzy memory that she did not harm Martha. Julia then tells herself that she could maybe speak to the white lady of the lake to get some answers, asking who could have hurt Martha, even though it sounds silly. As Julia heads towards the lake, she notices a gunfight between partisans and German soldiers, who she follows coming to a tragic stop when she witnesses the dismembered corpse of Lapo lying on the ground, who seemingly stepped on a landmine, even though the town they are in isn't a battlefield and shouldn't have any landmines. As Julia reads a letter addressed to her by Lapo, explaining how she knows Julia is still alive and how he could easily differentiate between them. One of the German soldiers shoots Julia from the back, leading to her collapsing to the ground with life slowly leaving her body. The German soldier stand next to her buddy, discussing how she was one of the partisans as she was wearing a Lapo scarf, which seemingly was a symbol of what they fought for, a symbol of freedom, portraying that Lapo was a member of partisans. The soldiers quickly realize she was Edek's daughter, making them realize they're in big trouble, who quickly flee, running away from responsibility. When I returned, I found myself once again in the midst of a bad dream one whose meaning I did not understand at the time.
As Julia's mind hovers in darkness, she witnesses a puppet show narrated by death. The death explains how he wanted to claim Julia, but since the sisters looked identical, they both claim to be Martha to avoid their fate. Death then explains that Martha would suffer the same fate in midst of war soon enough, which makes the sisters have a quick discussion before one stepping forward, claiming to be Julia. Death, analyzing her tone and expressions, believes she is deceiving him to sacrifice herself for Julia while being Martha. Instead of confronting them, he asks them how they reached their decision, to which they explain that they had a medallion which they flipped. Death, explaining that fate is his ally and corresponds with him, with Julia being destined to die, accepts their explanation and takes the girl that came forward. But when it's already done, he analyzes the medallion, noticing that Martha is engraved on both sides, with the sisters managing to fool both death and fate. This in a way explains that Julia didn't have a medallion and she was the one supposed to die as if she was a mistake. A being that shouldn't exist, yet managing to rise against all odds and survive. Waking up healed from the gunshot as if it was just a superficial scratch, Julia listens to their doctor who calls it a miracle that the bullet missed any vital organs. Julia continues reading the letter by Lapo where she left off, who informs her to remember the number 6934 in case things get ugly with no further elaboration. In another newspaper article, the ridiculous political propaganda has yet again displayed how they labeled Julia's shooting as a politically driven motive, with the article blatantly lying that German troops found her while in fact it was her mother, with the German troops being the ones who shot her. The telephone soon rings, with a nanny being on the other side, with Julia informing her that she's alive, making the nanny very happy. They decide to meet later, but unfortunately, a bomb lands on the villa, killing the nanny the very same day, a place where the family should have been in, dying instead of the poor nanny. Julia proceeds to call the number written on the letter, which is a direct line to the partisan group, instructing Julia to continue Lapo's work. They explain that she needs to cut a line going to German bases who monitor the conversations to be able to communicate with them and that she should use telegrams from now on. Julia informs her father about this incident, which he agrees and explains that she should comply, as despite being the army general, he hates the war equally and wants to see it stopped. As Julia proceeds to cut the cable, she finds traces of her mother's dress, suspecting that her mother could have been involved in killing Martha, believing in her own mind that she was killing Julia. After the funeral, being overwhelmed with thoughts and pressure of losing her beloved sister, whom she felt complete with, she starts playing piano, not caring anymore if they realize she's not Martha, explaining that she wanted to feel alive. Playing piano would be a clear sign that it's not Martha, as Martha didn't know how to play. Irene comes to the scene, observing Julia playing, realizing in shock that it's been her all along, with her favorite daughter, Martha, being dead. She explodes on Julia, threatening to lock her up in an asylum, berating her and trying to make her feel useless. Julia tries to explain that she tried to save Martha, but Irene doesn't believe her and gets even angrier, hitting her with anything she finds at hand, clearly displaying that she hates her, preferring Martha, wishing it was Julia who drowned. A loving Irek, who loves Julia with all his heart, consoles with her, reassuring her that Irene loves her and just became upset, telling her that he loves her. But Julia fully knows that he tries to make her just feel better. Julia subsequently goes to the little island in the middle of the lake, using tarot cards to communicate with the white lady. Shockingly, the white lady indeed shows up, explaining that the cards allow them to communicate. Julia, experiencing such a groundbreaking event, just lets out a quick excitement gasp, as if it's just any other Wednesday. The white lady explains she doesn't know who killed her sister and that she needs to figure it out herself, then speaks in riddles and eventually pulls her into the water. Thank you.
Swimming under the water as if she doesn't need to breathe, she takes a key from a corpse under the water seemingly belonging to Martha and then suddenly awakens in a bathtub, still holding on to the same key. It seems as if Julia was in fact drowning herself, imagining that she was talking to the white lady while being in the bathtub. She uses the key and manages to open Martha's trinket box, where she finds a letter by Martha. July 16th. Dear sister, I entrust my secrets to this letter. If you are reading it, things have gone as I thought they might and I am no longer there with you. First of all, I am not deaf and I never was. Mother scared me when we were little, so I decided not to speak or listen anymore. It worked. In fact, Mother began to love me. They also found a scientific explanation for my deafness. Neurological damage caused by excessive pressure exerted by the twin during pregnancy progressively led to hearing loss. And like that, my decision was also transformed into a fault of yours. So I must put it right. Do I have any other secrets? Unfortunately, yes, but a letter is too cold for such matters. Now that you know that I can speak, please go to the dark room. I have a hidden recording. Martha seems to have been abused by their mother as well, who decided to pretend that she's deaf so that she didn't have to listen to her mother anymore, which led to her mother taking a pity on her. A recording is then left for Julia in the dark room, which she goes to, to listen to. Hi Julia, I know that this will seem absurd, but this is me and this is my voice. We're equals in this sense too. Well, it's obvious, really. I've basically always spoken and you were my voice. I'm going to meet my fate, so I don't want there to be any more secrets between us. I have to tell you that I'm... I'm pregnant, Julia. I'm pregnant with Lapo's baby. We had sex, and I never had the courage to tell you. I was so afraid of hurting you. I'm so ashamed. And now? How can I ever bring this child into the world? The baby is starting to show. Could you tell? That's why I'm no longer getting undressed in front of you. But for how much longer can I hide it? Yesterday, you asked me to go to the lake together early in the morning. You, the sleepyhead. Early. I asked you to switch beds with me, like we used to when we were little girls. I got up at dawn and didn't wake you. I put on one of your dresses. I wrote a card to mother telling her that it was you who was pregnant, not me, and to come and see at the lake. I left it on the desk in her room. Then I felt the need to talk to you and I remembered the recorder in the dark room. I will go to the lake alone and act as you. I will tell her everything you never had the courage to tell her. I will be your voice. I know how much she's made you suffer over the years. Unlike you, I remember all of the harm she has done to you and it is my fault. Take my place, sister. You will live a better life and I will be able to rest in peace knowing that I at least tried to put right what I have done wrong. I will go now. My last memory will be the image of you sleeping peacefully. Julia then recalls 16th of July, the day she and her sister were supposed to go to the lake together. She remembers that when she woke up, she noticed her dress being missing and that there were no signs of Martha. Julia goes to the lake nonetheless to take photographs, realizing it must have been Irene who took Martha's life, drowning her with her own hands, being enraged that she was pregnant, especially as she didn't like her and looked down at her. That's why she rushed towards Julia, hugging her, believing that she's Martha without even asking, displaying how she thought she knew the dead sister as Julia. Back to the current time, with Irene now knowing that her only living daughter is Julia, the daughter she hates so much, Julia arms herself with her father's pistol in order to protect herself in case of Irene intending to kill her. Soon a mailman brings a letter entailing information on how Irene wants to lock Julia up in an asylum, donating large sums of money, in other words, bribing the physicians to take her against her will. Julia even thinks about the other possibility that she would kill Julia, making it seem that it was self-inflicted, labeling her as mentally unstable. I believe that hope is long gone. I agree. But in Germany, there are better treatments in specialized clinics. 
The asylum is a temporary solution, just to ensure that she doesn't do anything foolish. But it's a nightmarish place. You know that all too well. You cannot possibly want this for your daughter. Of course I don't. But what can I do? She is a danger to herself, to us, to everyone. One of Eric's guns has also disappeared. She must have taken it. Who else could it have been? I am so scared, Doctor. I cannot wait any longer. Also, you know what they think of Italians in Germany, don't you? But you would be with Erich, an esteemed general. Everyone will respect you. That cursed girl. Where could she be? Let's hope she doesn't play any more foolish stunts. I'll wait for her here, in the cellar. Sooner or later, she'll go to the dark room. That's for sure. I would gladly stay and keep an eye on her. But I must rush to town to organize the last few things for her hospitalization. Thank you, Doctor. Don't worry. We'll see you later. Meanwhile, Julia still bothered by the question if Martha was indeed pregnant. She proceeds to go to the family crib to find out. She takes a pair of scissors and desecrates her corpse in an unimaginable manner, finding out that the fetus was deformed with two heads, in a way playing as an analogy to the twin sisters, Martha and Julia. She proceeds to take a picture as evidence and leaves, magically ending up in the house's cellar, with Irene sitting on a chair, being on guard to capture her and send her to an asylum. Julia notices that Irene is sleeping, taking advantage of the situation in order to go to the dark room and collect her evidence against her that she was the one who murdered Martha. As developing the film would take some time, she puts the recorder on, unknown to Irene, and points the pistol at her, interrogating her about Martha's death for her to confess her crime. Just as she's about to wake Irene up, she has a blackout, witnessing that her mother just got shot, with her having another memory lapse. What are you doing, my daughter? Why do you want to ruin your life? I'm sorry. It wasn't me who just shot mummy. Irena begs Julia to stop as this would ruin her life. Nonetheless, Julia has another blackout, ending her mother's life there and then. Julia terrified to the scene as she didn't intentionally pull the trigger, desperately tries to develop the rolls of film that she collected from the camera set at the lakeside on the day of murder. So maybe she could get some sort of evidence or picture that Irene drowned Martha. Meanwhile, Julia searches Irene's corpse where she finds her childhood's bedroom key, where a puppet show theater is located within. Julia uses the puppets to reenact the previous events so maybe she could remember her memory lapses with a reenacting Martha's murder with Irene beating her with a cane and eventually ending up with her playing a little game of taking her mother's puppet apart subsequently burying her in the ground as she stops playing, she notices herself holding her mother's head, realizing that in fact she dismembered her mother's corpse and buried her to get rid of any evidence while she had blacked out. But, but it was just a game. This, however, is not a game. I was just playing. Julia puts the head next to the rest of the body where it was buried and heads back home to develop the film roles, trying to justify her death with Irene having Kat killed Martha. As one of the photos is being developed, Julia notices in shock that the person killing Martha was no other than herself, who probably just had another blackout not remembering the event. Coming to the conclusion that she's a monster, killing both her sister and mother, even though she was nasty to her, a soldier kicks in the door, accompanied by a group tying Julia and her father Erik to chairs. The group starts beating Julia relentlessly and mercilessly, hitting her face with a short cane, breaking her teeth and making blood pour out of her face. While getting irreversible facial injuries and deformities, the soldiers force her to confess that her father Erik was doing all sort of stuff in the German army committing war crimes. Julia, overwhelmed by the pain, unaware of anything they're saying, just gives them what they need to hear, confessing falsely against her father. Right there and then, the leader of the group executes Erik and making a statement against Julia in contempt that all it took was a couple of slaps for her to sell out her father, berating her as being German. 
This displays the cruelty in war and that the group were seemingly partisans or allies, harming and destroying anything they thought to be related to Germany. Despite Iraq even despising the war and what he did, even helping the partisans with secret messages. The general of the group orders a soldier to finish Julia off, with everyone except the commanded soldier staying, who shoots the ground, cutting Julia open, seemingly taking pity on her, with Julia yet again having a close encounter with death. Julia stands up after the soldiers leave the house, trembling and shaking with each walk due to the unbearable pain. She goes to the dark room to listen to the recordings, to the voice of her parents one last time as she's all alone now. Now I will wake her up and she will confess. You can bet on it. What do you do with your father's gun? It's dangerous. Stop it. Talk. Tell me everything now. Tell me what you have done. Okay, okay. Calm down. I will tell you everything. I found that strange note when I woke up, and I immediately realized that something was wrong. Something was up with you, aside from your usual quirks. I came to check, but you weren't in your bedroom. You had spoken about the lake, and I got worried, so I called your father, and we went to see what was going on. We found you sitting in your underwear at the side of the lake. You kept saying that nothing had happened, and you kept repeating things like that. I hugged you to try and make you feel better, but you did not speak again for days. What is happening to you? You should tell me what's going on. I'm not going to that loony bin. I would never have wanted this, but I'm afraid you will harm yourself further. You were really hurting yourself in front of the piano that night. What else could we do? You killed my sister and now you're afraid because I found out. So you're making up stories, aren't you? But I'm not falling for it this time. What are you saying? Your sister. Please, no. I was not well. I didn't know what I was saying. So many years have passed, you were little then. I thought everyone had forgotten that nonsense. Shut up. Don't speak. Don't say anything else. What are you doing, my daughter? Why do you want to ruin your life? I'm sorry. It wasn't me who just shot mummy. It wasn't me. I didn't know who I was anymore. Everything had fallen apart. The recording displays a conversation between her and Irene, who seems to be much kinder and gentler. Irene insists that the only reason she wanted to hospitalize her was because Julia kept hurting herself. Julia, having no clue what Irene is talking about, confronts her about killing her sister, Martha, which confuses Irene, admitting she didn't used to be well, with Julia being too young then, thinking that everyone had forgotten something. That's when Julia, not in control, having a blackout, pulls the trigger and kills Irene in cold blood. Julia, being sure that she doesn't know herself anymore, horrified to who she really is, goes to the puppet theater once more to maybe collect pieces of lost memories from her childhood and her life. The puppet theater shows a hard labor Irene had to endure, almost dying with only one child being born, named Martha. Yet with Julia explaining that it was her who caused her a lot of pain during childbirth, creating a contradiction. This could potentially explain how Irene ended up being infertile with the childbirth damaging her reproductive organs. During her childbirth is depicted how Irene was impatient and not ready to be a mother yet, thinking as Martha as a nuisance while Irene was interested in painting and expressing herself that way. Martha accidentally makes Irene's canvas drop, leading to Irene picking up Irek's cane and beating Martha brutally, displayed in Martha's puppet face cracking, with a newly deformed face appearing of her having her mouth and ears sewn shut, displaying the reason why Martha chose to pretend she's deaf so that she can shut all the trauma out, not having to listen or speak to her mother anymore. After that, Julia comes into the mix, being comfort for Martha, hugging her and taking the punishment instead of her. As Martha had been scarred due to trauma already, not able to express herself anymore, with Julia taking over as if she was a creation by Martha to act like a shield, so that her brain can shut off when she's experiencing pain. While being punished, Irene restraining Julia on a chair, torturing her, the family pet dog comes to her help, 
which angers Irene, leading to her cooking the dog alive in a boiling pot. No, mommy, please! Julia calls Irene insane, which angers her more, who forcefully feeds the dog to her. I said eat! As she shouts for help for her father, Irene in a mock yet hurt manner explains that the father is at home as usual, displaying how helpless Julia is. Unable to continue with her puppet theater play, as the memories are too hard to go over, Julia stops momentarily, calling the priest for help, who instructs her to go to the church for shelter, being very supportive. As Julia heads to the church, she observes German troops nearby, but ultimately deciding to avoid them alongside allies, as both had caused her immense harm, with Germans shooting her and spreading political propaganda, and the allies torturing her. Entering the church, Julia loses touch with reality completely, entering a puppet show of her own with everyone around her being dead except for her. Uncovering a doorway, she enters an imaginary land with puppets all over and crosses, depicting how it seems like a game in her mind, unable to differentiate between reality and fiction. She explains that crossing the barrier, she witnessed flashes of cameras and that she encountered a man dressed in white, a doctor, asking her questions she didn't understand, with two nurses taking her away. Julia then explains that she was in fact in a mental asylum, a patient who had to be tied down due to harming herself, being administered drugs to calm her. After being untied, she would start all over again, cursing the doctors and nurses, getting tied down again, spending majority of her time in the asylum, restrained to a bed. Julia then proceeds to explain that a part of her died inside, finally giving in to the doctors and nurses, getting quiet and stopping herself. Nonetheless, she could never forget the trauma she had endured, something she still needed to revisit, to fill the voids in her memory. Finally, reaching a mirror, she uncovers it, noticing a human-sized puppet following her every move, being no other than herself. The puppet uses sign language to communicate, being no other than Martha, the original identity of the buddy that they share. Julia explains that she killed Martha so that she could possess her buddy and take her life. She further explains that she killed Irene, burying her buddy remains, and that her father actually died by the soldiers. She continues that her nanny died in bombings, being in their villa while they took shelter in her house for safety, and that Lapo died by stepping on a landmine. Eventually, the pregnancy happened, with the fetus being deformed. However, in a turn of events, it's explained that anything could have happened. It all could have been the imagination of Martha and Julia, both in one body, playing out as a puppet show, with Lapo even possibly not existing and that none of it actually matter anymore. Eventually, the puppet explaining how she used her hands to kill and how her womb was conceived in sin regarding to the pregnancy and finally, aging down to a child form, she explains how her mind turned them into monsters. The puppet then takes over the strings, controlling Julia's body from there on, explaining how they cannot live like this anymore, bringing it to an abrupt end for Julia so that she can take over with Julia seemingly dying. Julia or Martha then narrate similarly in the beginning that the town they were located in was bombed with the church getting destroyed, killing every single person in it. However, unlike how the vision of Julia played out, she didn't actually go to the church as she was already in an asylum. She continues that war has ended now for some time and that she has faced the truth and is on the right side of the gate, not requiring another imaginary identity to help her, depicting how how she is Martha now, having gotten rid of Julia. She then asks when she would be taken home, revealing that she had been getting reviewed by a doctor in the asylum, tailing her story to them. The mirror symbolizes how Julia imprisoned Martha in a mirror of her own reflection, being a puppet, with her body being controlled by Julia, a stronger version of herself, a created identity who took the punishments until she finally took over the entire body at the lake. This identity was created by Martha after experiencing the trauma under Irene's hands, who took the punishments in order for Martha not to suffer anymore. Martha, pretending to be deaf, with Irene 
and regretting her past mistakes as heard in the recording. She despises Martha's created identity, Julia, as she wants her daughter back, seemingly knowing of the existence of Julia and feeling responsible for her dissociative identity disorder. That's why Julia has memory lapses and blackouts, as other parts of her brain take over occasionally, being a fabricated and created identity by Martha. When Martha explains that she went to the lake to pretend to be Julia being pregnant, it all seemingly played out in her mind, with her wanting to fully kill Martha, the original owner and identity of the body. She even explains how the lake was hers, a place of solace and peace. Martha seemingly was pregnant in fact, but had a miscarriage, explained in the massive blood loss of Julia when woken up, with her own mind interpreting it as cutting herself open and removing the fetus, displaying what a vivid imagination she had. The medallion they owned only had Martha's name engraved, explaining how only Martha truly existed, or at least was supposed to before Julia was born in her mind and made as her sister. That's why Death wanted to take Julia in the puppet show, the created identity that wasn't supposed to exist, but accidentally took Martha. The face of Martha also shows facial scarring and broken teeth, depicting that she in fact was tortured and interrogated by the soldiers. Therefore, with the fuzzy mind of Martha, unable to recall the memories and tell between reality and fiction, it's in a way left to the player's own interpretation. I believe everything happened according to what she experienced, with her father dying and she getting facial injuries after interrogations, she killing her own mother with Lapo having had died, unclear if by stepping on mines or any other way. All of this combined with the trauma of war and the fear of not waking up the next day, Martha's mental health worsens, with her being hospitalized in an asylum to recover, after Irene witnesses how badly she hurts herself. That's why going to the church was coincided with her entering an imaginary world, explaining that pictures were being taken while she was taken to an asylum, depicting how her story was seemingly shared with public and the press, for being the daughter of a German army general General and killing her mother, being labeled as mentally insane, ending up in a mental asylum. The flashes of cameras depict how she became a subject of interest to media as well. Miraculously, she mentally recovers, with a doctor finally releasing her after a review, concluding that she's healthy, with Julia seemingly not present anymore. Or maybe Martha, or maybe even both. With a new identity even possibly being born, as she did explain that a part of her died in the asylum, with Martha having had been murdered already and Julia's life being taken by the puppet Martha. Something inside of me had died, but nevertheless I insisted on carrying along this painful journey. I was stronger than I could ever have imagined. <sighs> What a tense and gripping story, even though fictional. I just can't help imagining that similar things must have happened to people in real life who went through a variety of traumas. I need to watch something lighter to clear my mind now, even though I really love the story. It's been your host, Star. Thanks for being here, folks, and I will see you on the next one. <laughs>